kind of popped across my desk. I wanted to jump on it right away because we do have a lot of farmers in the area as well. It's going to deal with farm reference prices, which is a term I was not familiar with until uh, this segment we're about to do. Uh, that does the intro before we bring in our guests, our co-host, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Billy. Good morning, Rob. Glad and, to be uh, here. Sitting high atop her, uh, the tallest chair perch. we have in the room. Yes, yes. Perch. I like that. Maria Lawrence and Maria. Good morning. Bill, of course, a former Berkeley County Commission president, retired Admiral Maria, former editor of the Journal, and uh, currently employed at hospice, uh, where they do such great work. Thank so, you. Uh, good stuff there, Maria. Thank you. Joshua Sewell is our guest here as we bring him on via telephone. Joshua is the Director of Policy and Research for uh, Taxpayers for Common Sense. Joshua, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Hey, thank you for having me. I really appreciate this. Yeah, and I appreciate the information you folks sent out because it involved our local Congressman Alex Mooney in, in regards to a vote uh, that he took on this as well. And, and maybe you could give us kind of like the ground-up view on the specifics of what we're talking about in regards to farm reference pricing and what this vote entailed. Yeah, well, we only have an hour, so I don't know how many days you're going to spend on this. But, uh, um, so the, the immediate issue here is this is a year where Congress is supposed to take up a farm bill. And for those who may not be familiar, farm bill is a, it's a, this year will be about a hundred, excuse me, $1.5 trillion bill uh, that will set ag policy and nutrition policy for the next five years. And so it's a really important bill and um, it's something that every member of Congress needs to weigh in on. And this specific issue about reference prices, this is involves um, what are a government guaranteed minimum price for a number of crops that are grown across this country. Uh, and the level that Congress sets that, that price at in the bill uh, will determine whether or not, uh, or I should say determine exactly how generous um, farm subsidies will be for growers of those crops. So okay. that's, uh, that's the, the quick and dirty of what a reference price is. So that means if, if the market falls out on a particular price of a crop, the government is there to back up the price so the farmer doesn't go out of business. That's the idea behind it, yes. Okay. Now, specifically in regards to raising farm reference prices, uh, if you are a farmer, I suppose you would think, well, this is great. I'm going to get more money from my crops, correct? Uh, you, you might think that. Now, the, the challenge with the, the reference prices is they really only apply to – about 20 to 24 crops, known as commodity crops, mm -hmm. and it does cover some of the most widely grown crops. You're thinking things like corn, soybean, cotton, wheat, and rice, um, but it doesn't apply to anything else. So all the fruits, all the vegetables, all the livestock, whether it's cattle or uh, or chickens or egg producers, uh, and it doesn't cover um, any of the, the crops that go into feeding those, um, unless you are, I mean, you're growing uh, your own corn, perhaps, mm -hmm. but it doesn't cover cover pasture and doesn't touch forestry. Why are so those a smaller subset of crops? Why are those particular crops subsidized and others are not? Part of this is history. It's what we've subsidized uh, since we started subsidizing. Um, most of those crops are ones that we first started in the first farm programs back in the 1920s and 30s in the in the Dust Bowl. So some of this is a legacy of it's what we've always done, and it's and it's how the subsidies. Uh, some of it is a perpetual motion machine since those are the most subsidized crop. They're the easiest to grow in some respects financially, um, and also they are um, some of the most widely grown crops. You know, it's a chicken and egg issue, but um, it, so it's a little bit of both of those issues. And why is this uh, issue of, re of raising reference prices something at this time that has gotten so much attention? There's a number of reasons. Um, one is because it's really expensive to do this. So uh, the farm programs – even without any changes, uh, as they exist right now, the Congressional Budget Office, which is the official scorekeeper of the cost of legislation, the likely cost of legislation, expects us to spend, like I said, $1.5 trillion on the overall bill. 80% um, of that is food nutrition programs, which are not directly farm programs. But in that other $300 billion, it's about anywhere from 5 to $8 billion a year on these two programs called ARC and PLC. And these are the programs that would uh, – that the, the checks that come out of those are dependent upon the reference prices, and that's without any changes. Uh, and so the challenge is the many members of Congress and the Senate want to increase those reference prices, and if you do it, say, 10 percent, the projection that it would add about $20 billion to that price tag. If you increase each one of those prices 20 percent, it would add be closer to $50 billion. 
So we're talking about potentially doubling the cost of that one program or two programs in the farm bill and not even touch, talking about the other dozens or hundreds, depends on how you break it down, of programs that people also want to increase. So it really becomes an issue of it's a lot of money, and as I'm sure your, your listeners are aware, money's an issue in Washington right now. So how do you find a way to pay for this is a real challenge. And, and how does geography factor into this too? Well, this is another issue here in that um, there are some people who think we shouldn't do this at all. Uh, but then it becomes even if you want to have these programs, they really don't support farmers in, across the country. And like I said, you know, there's only about 30 um, percent of farmers are growing or even eligible for these programs because they're growing those crops. And of those farmers, it's really about 10 percent that historically have received 70 to 80 percent of the subsidy because it's mostly based on acres. So the more acres you have the more likely that you will get uh, a, a bigger check. And so, but because of the nature of reference prices, again, we're talking about a government-enforced minimum crop price. And so when you look at the markets over the last few years, all of agriculture as a, as a whole has done pretty well. In fact, two years ago, 2022, was a record profit for, for the sector, it's like $189 billion uh, in profits. And last year was pretty close, about down, you know, they dropped down to 150 billion, which is still above historic averages. The challenge with reference prices is that these programs, because of the, the price of corn and soy in the market has been so high, it hasn't actually triggered prices, uh, the, the payments under these programs in recent years. It has, or it's about to, in cotton and rice, and it has triggered every single year for peanuts. And so if you think about it, the places we grow corn and cotton pretty much, excuse me, corn and soybeans pretty much anywhere across the country. Cotton production and certainly so, uh, peanut production and even rice is dominated, it's consolidated in southern states. So we're talking under the, we don't have official bill language yet, but from the things we've seen, uh, the way the, these reference prices increases would actually benefit only about maybe maybe 33 congressional districts. And they're all certainly south of y'all in, in West Virginia. They're mostly in the, in the deep south and then up into the Missouri Blue Hill. My co-host Bill Stubblefield yeah. worked on a cotton farm as a youth. Well, kid, Bill. yeah, we raised cotton and also uh, raised peanuts. So I'm a little, I'm somewhat familiar with the subsidies. Uh, it's my impression, uh, and I'll, if Joshua disagrees, he'll correct me, that the, uh, the history of the subsidies was those crops that are weather dependent more than the others. Whether you have a good crop of peanuts is whether you have sufficient rain. Uh, raising beef cattle or dairy cattle is less weather dependent. So that was one of the reasons they targeted subsidies. Uh, but uh, Joshua, you, you've partly answered the, my, my question, uh, and that is why uh, cotton, rice, and peanuts as opposed to soybeans, wheat, and corn. Uh, and you said that was because the, the first three have triggered certain uh, uh, triggered a threshold. The others have not yet. But if you're looking at this in the long term, uh, over the years, uh, wheat and corn have also triggered these same thresholds, have they not? So why mm -hmm. are you targeting only three and not a broader base? Well, I think the challenge is, and as you mentioned, uh, the the ag the federal ag safety net is is a complex beast. There are you know, we're only talking about ARC and PLC right now. Um, there's also a whole thing called crop insurance, which is federally subsidized insurance, um, which is actually usually pays out not even if you lose a crop. It's actually guaranteeing a certain level of revenue, and that is available to pretty much anybody of any crop. Um, and it's even getting into the to the cattle and the other livestock industries. So. The challenge here right now is that, you know, it's a question of, like I said, part of it is just this math. Like how can, if we want to spend more money in these areas, how do we pay for it in a, in a bill, but then also in a federal budget that has a $34 trillion in debt right now? Uh, the other issue is that when you look at the history of payments, there are the way the various programs have been designed in the past, they have, they have paid out in certain areas and for certain crops, uh, more often, regardless of the conditions. And so it's, with this particular program, it's, you know, the challenge with peanuts specifically, like they have gotten a payment since the program was created in 2014. And so 
it's a complicated market, but it begs the question of have we as legislators or have they as, as legislators set this level of price unrealistically high for what's actually going to happen in the market? And apparently it has, you know, just because it's triggered payments literally every single year and is projected to every single year in the future. So it starts to come to the question of like, what is preventing those producers from, from getting a higher price uh, and how much, what steps can we take or importantly as well, what steps should we take um, as a government to intervene in that market to come with a different outcome? And so then that's when it starts to get really complicated, right? About exactly what we should do versus what can we afford to do? Because those can be two different questions. And I apologize if I talk too long. I, I mean, I do work in Washington. Like, <laughs> you're, you're, fine. you're fine. Uh, I don't get paid very well to talk. I do work at a nonprofit, but I do get paid to talk. Yeah. Yeah, you, we're talking about uh, crops, uh, and I kind of alluded a while ago to cattle and the like. There have been certain instances where we've had a disease in, a, in an area, mm -hmm. uh, a mad cow disease and the dairy cattle in Wisconsin and the like, where there's been direct subsidies uh, to the farmers uh, to, to somewhat help them out. Would your bill address this aspect of uh, uh, of subsidies or aid to the farmers? And before you answer that, Josh, get, uh, just a moment. I've just uh, seen this alert. Lanes 2 and 3, I-81 northbound, 20-mile marker shut down due to a traffic accident. That's northbound, mile marker 20, Interstate 81, lanes 2 and 3, shut down. So avoid 81 if you can at this hour. Go ahead, Josh. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no problem. So, the Farm Bill does have a, a standing program that was authorized in the last two Farm Bills because this happens about every five years uh, and would, we would anticipate having in this bill as well called the Livestock Indemnity Program, which makes payments to owners of livestock when they have loss of life. And it was actually modified, uh, I should say, excess mortality. You, know, you always expect a handful, some percentage to, to perhaps die. Um, but if you have excess because of weather or disease, then there is compensation there. And they've also modified it so that if you actually have to have a, a fire sale, because we saw a lot of that with actual fire, um, wildfire issues, but then even on some of the, the disease issues of selling below, you flooded the market with beef a couple years ago. And so now that program does cover some of those losses, and that would be something that they'd look to tweak in this farm bill to, to have this established program that we know if this happens in the future, there is a safety net there for those farmers. And that's, that's really what our ask is of, of Congress and many of the folks um, who've worked on this particular issue and others in the farm bill is you know, we don't actually oppose having farm subsidies or a farm safety net, uh, but we want to have that stable and predictable safety net where we know in the deep loss environment where you have a catastrophic uh, flood or a catastrophic drought that you where that goes beyond the capacity of the individual or the sector for protecting itself, then that's a, an appropriate place for the government to step in. The challenge is that people's definition of deep loss gets shallower and shallower uh, you know, when it comes to, to election time sometimes. And so that's one of the challenges here is, is yeah, designing programs that will pay out for folks to protect them against things that they truly can't protect themselves against versus sending money to folks simply because – that's what we like to do in Washington sometimes. West Virginia reps Alex Mooney and Carol Miller joined a uh, group which uh, signed a letter opposing these increases, by the way. Go ahead, uh, Maria. So in your press release that you provided um, to us before the fact, Josh, you talk about how this is really um, – these subsidies, subsidies really um, will affect the big corporate um, – farm organizations, if you will, entities. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Who are we who are we talking about here versus a guy that has a few acres, you know, down in Jefferson County? And, and it wouldn't be Jefferson County because we don't grow these crops. But um, can you talk <laughs> right. about that a little bit? Yeah. So the nature of, again, U.S. agriculture, one of the reasons I work on farm policy is because it's such a diverse area and there's such a great uh, diversity of, of individuals who are, are growing and, and operating in different manners. Um, the truth is when you look at USDA numbers, there are about, by their definition, 2 million farms. Um, and that counts everything from, from your, from your uh, 45 to 60,000 acre cotton farm in West Texas uh, to your 
like you said, six to 10, 15 acre sometime operation, uh, which is either just a handful of, of cows uh, or a small um, direct to consumer crop operation. And so in reality, there's probably, you'd argue 350, 400,000 production farms, we call them. Those are the ones that make the bulk of, of these crops, especially. Uh, it's a little different in cattle because it's much more um, smaller guys play a bigger role. Uh, that's starting to consolidate and change as well. But on this row crop production, it's 350, 400,000 operations. But in there, the consolidation has gotten bigger and bigger every year. Uh, and so now the average size of the farm, has got, it, it, it raises every year. Um, I don't have it off the top of my head, but it's it's gotten, it's more than doubled, I think, in the last 10 years. And so because these payments are made on a per acre basis, uh, it's those larger farms are going to hoover up a larger amount of the money. You know, and so that in of itself may not be an issue for some folks, but one of the challenges here is that the safety net program is supposed to it's be sold to us as something to help people when they can't help themselves. You know, in agriculture, it's true. You can't, you can't control the weather. We all know that. Uh, it doesn't take you much time in this business to see the vagaries that happen there. But the bigger you get, the more leeway you do have in, in mitigating some of those harms. And so it's you're already diversified across, you're spread across a larger area, uh, you're less likely to get hit by, you might get hit by the by, by a, a tornado or hail, but it's not going to wipe out your whole farm because you're spread out over multiple counties when you get to that size uh, in multiple states in some respects. Um, and then you have different crops, and so you get this natural hedge if you're growing corn and soy over here, uh, and you can grow some other crops uh, in your other areas. And so the larger you get, the more capable you are on your own to like in other businesses, to um, navigate those markets. So it becomes a question now really about how do we as taxpayers get the most out of our money? How do we keep that diversity in agriculture and help those folks who are smaller, maybe midsize, uh, who really can potentially get wiped out um, from one event? How do we help them to the next year? And I think part of that is prioritizing these programs based on on size. And so you can have a, have a limit to the number of maybe the uh, annual payments you can get um, so it's not really the size of the operation, but it's the amount of money you make from it. Joshua, you made a point a few minutes, a couple minutes ago about this bill is designed or try to differentiate between those farmers in real need as opposed to those that are just cushioning their sizable profit margin. That is a pretty subtle distinction. How are you going to sell that uh, to, the, uh, to the, our legislators in election year? Especially those in farming states. Especially in farming states. And I, uh, and even though you've targeted now the South, uh, but much the same thing could be might uh, apply to the Midwest in another year. Yeah. No, definitely. Well, part of it is, uh, so I'm originally from Missouri, so I get to have these conversations when I go back and visit family, too. Um, so it's yeah, yeah I, I hear it from I hear it from everyone. <laughs> I'll put that out there. Um, it's also well, part of it is it really comes down for us as a fiscal conservative group is we have to start making choices. And we don't oppose having a safety net. But we do oppose looking let's just put this back in perspective here is we know the future can be different, but the last three years, if you count now, we'll have final numbers for for the farm income for 2023 well we should have that in february when usda updates it i think it's actually next week we look at the last three years and the the overall again this is for the whole sector the overall level of profitability was record two years ago and three of the top i want to say seven years of the last 50 in the last three years so you they most farmers have had a great run of success the last three years and even the two years before it were above average. So it's a five-year run that's unheralded, un, unmatched in the, in, since we've been keeping records. Basically, we've had the best three years of agriculture since we created agriculture thousands of years ago, and that's not really an exaggeration. So the question becomes, when legislators look at that and some of these members of Congress, and it's not just the Southern, the southern growers, it's, it's certain people from certain farms, other farm states, they're coming out and telling us, we are – facing a crisis we are facing bankruptcies and the question is like is that actually true and if it is to me that begs the question of if, especially if you're one of these folks in these areas that hasn't been subject to drought and hasn't been subject to some of these uh, market gyrations as much 
you should be in a great position three years after, after having three years of great success. We should be able to keep our just our existing savings at the very least. You know, just don't make it more generous. Let's make sure what we have done that has worked so far is maintained. And then the other thing I got to be honest about this is, you know, we are not the most popular people with uh, the the ad committees at times. Uh, but neither is Mr. Mooney. <laughs> Anyone who who who's not on the ad committee and comes out and says, I have an interest in this bill, it, it's kind of a, it's an insider's club in some respects. Mm -hmm. But I wonder what Mr. Mooney would good. say if you targeted apples. <clears throat> uh, that's a good question. I'd have to ask him specifically. But I do think the, the idea here is that we want to have a safety net that works, and it's one program is not going to work for everybody. That's why we have more than one program. And there is the crop insurance program does have a – have a Apple production, an Apple revenue program, so that you can actually have two choices. You can purchase a crop insurance that pays if you lose a certain percentage of your yield or, which most people do, a, a percentage of your revenue. So it does exist, and whether he wants to make it more generous or not, you'd have to ask him and his staff. But um, it does come down to the idea of we need we can have a safety net, but when we're here in this, we're still, we haven't even finished the budget, the annual budget for this year. That we're under, we're more than a third of the way through the through the um, uh, calendar year now. Excuse me, the uh, fiscal year, and so we're having these tough conversations on the domestic side. We're even having these conversations on our defense spending. We need to start moving this towards our entitlement programs, which, and it's not it's not a four letter word called an entitlement. It's just that if you exist and meet those those um, criteria, you are entitled to a payment under under farm programs, same like Social Security and Medicare. We have to have these conversations yes. and these places ended up being third rails or sacred cows for certain folks. Well, Josh, the last thing I'd say on this, we, there's 435 voting members, and so we all pay taxes. We all have a vote. We all need to have a voice and a vote on this bill. Um, well, Josh, your, your point is a good one. We're looking at trillion-dollar deficits and a $34 trillion debt. Everybody at some point should have to make some type of sacrifice, not a select few, but everybody at some point should have to make some kind of sacrifice to help get this back in line. And I think a point that's important here is the sacrifice that's been asked is on the profit side, that they're just in, they got a sizable profit and just trying to limit the amount of profit and not to take the profit away. Yeah, these, these are, again, as exactly. you pointed and it's out. not even, yeah, exactly. And I would say not even, it's more just ensure that there's opportunity to have that profit and not, not, Pad on to it, right? Not add on to it, yeah. regardless of circumstance from the federal government side. So, I, I'm a free market lover. I love that you can make money in agriculture. I want people. The goal of every safety net program for us, including nutrition programs and and other things, is that eventually you don't need them. That should be the goal of everybody. Mm -hmm. Like we want things to be focused on need, fiscally responsible, and ultimately foster that resilience instead of dependence. Because I've never met a farmer who says I want a government payment. They might exist. They don't talk to me. I, but I've never met someone who says I want to perpetually get a social safety net payment either. And I think that's just we got to think about that and make sure we design policies that give people an opportunity to help themselves, but also are there when those times come when they really can't help themselves. And that's why we have a safety net. So we don't want to eliminate it. But we've got to make sure, yeah, we don't get we don't get too lazy and get too used to some of these payments. And that's not that's not supposed to denigrate anyone in agriculture. But jo Josh, we're out. Of, to make some tough choices. We're out of time. I appreciate yours, man. All right, I appreciate it. I can always talk to you again. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Josh. Thank All you. All right, thank you. Josh Sewell, Director of Research and Policy and Taxpayers for Common Sense.